Hei vaan, olen Mikael, Notilla työskentelevä tähtitieteilijä, opiskelija ja tänään tuota, meillä on ohjelmassa Kierros Mätsikillä, joka on näistä Lapalmalla Kanarian saarella sijaitsevista teleskoopeista vähän erikoisemman mallinen johtuen siitä, että tämä ei ole varsinaisesti näkyvän valon alueen teleskooppi, kuten suurin osa tällä äm, vuorella olevista teleskoopeista. Esimerkiksi tuolla vasemmassa yläkulmassa näkyvä Nordic Optical Telescope on nimensä mukaan näkyvän valon aallonpituuden teleskooppi. Ja tosiaan ohjelmassa on katsella näitä kahta Magic-teleskooppia, jotka havaitsevat Serenkovin säteilyä. Kyseinen ä, fysiikan ja tähtitieteen ala ei ole ihan minun erikoisalaa, mutta onneksi ä, meillä on haastattelussa paikallinen työntekijä, joka osaa kertoa näistä teleskoopeista lisää. Hello! Hi. Nice to see you again! Nice to see you! So, can you tell us who are you and what do you do at Magic? Yes, sure. I'm Irene and I work as what we call locals. Not because we were born on the island, but because we live on this island and we take care of the maintenance of the telescopes. Meaning that we make sure that they can operate during the night. So our work is mostly during the day for mechanical maintenance or electrical maintenance. Mm -hmm. I started working here officially in March, but before being a local, I was taking shifts for the telescope, which means that um, Our operators are not living on the island. They come and go every month, not um, calendar month, but moon month. And a crew of, of five or four people in winter come here uh, from the institutions which are um, associated with magic and take a shift. So they take care of taking data. And this for them is a duty, meaning that for that year, they can sign papers. So they did something for the collaboration. Okay, cool. Who are these ob observers? Are they like uh, students or like uh, senior academics or both? Actually both, mm -hmm. because um, at the end of each year we make a count and every institution counts more or less for magic because it's according to the number of full members that you have. Every institution has a number of shifters that they have to send on site. And we tell them, okay, this is your number for this year. Tell us who's gonna come. Some institutions have a lot of PhD students, some master students, so they just send students, which would be the general idea because they can stay one month or two weeks. Two weeks is the minimum. So one month for someone who has a permanent position is a lot. But then some institutions don't have students. So they say, okay, I'm gonna send the senior. So we get a bit of both. It's good to be like uh, flexible in that sense and um, well, Uh, in, in the end of the day, it's the important thing that there are like um, observers who work, but it's good to, that they there are opportunities to, for uh, astronomers in many career phases. Yes, and also I have to say that some seniors want to come on shifts. So <laughs> we have students who say, well, one month is too much, and then we have a senior says, oh, I'm going. <laughs> so okay. people usually like to come on shift. All right, that sounds great. All right, okay. so now we are inside the gated area um, of Magic One. Um, can you tell us at this point what kind of objects do you observe with Mag Magic One and Two? So we are a Cherenkov telescope, meaning that we observe Cherenkov radiation. And this Cherenkov radiation in the atmosphere is generated by gamma rays. So what we observe is gamma ray sources. Mm -hmm. What happens is that when a gamma ray hits the atmosphere, a um, shower of secondary particles is generated, and this shower is superluminal in the atmosphere. Being superluminal, the consequence is Cherenkov radiation. Our sources, well, our beloved source is the Crab Nebula, which is mm -hmm. a galactic source, and is the one that we use to calibrate the Cherenkov telescopes. You build a new one, Crab Nebula, and was also the first one to be observed. The other sources that we look at are mostly extragalactic sources. Not the galactic ones are not important, but from northern hemisphere, the, the center of the galaxy is not that visible. And so we have mostly active galactic nuclei. 
and uh, GRBs, of course, it's, which are uh, gamma ray bursts. Of course, are not the only sources, but the most common. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I talk about GRBs because it's my field of study. Ah, okay. <laughs> and uh, I like them because they are super hard to get. Not that they are uncommon, but uh, the constraints to observe a GRB are so many that you must be lucky to find one. What kind of constraints do you have regarding these gamma ray burst observations? So these gamma ray bursts are what we call transient sources. So okay. we don't know when and where they will explode. Huh. In order to observe them, you want them to explode during the night, northern hemisphere night. <laughs> you want them to be close. Mm -hmm. You need the moon not to be there because magic cannot observe the moon. Okay. Uh, the reason is quite simple. We will we would burn the camera because our uh -huh. mirrors concentrate so many light, so much light, that if you observe with the moon, you flash the camera and it turns off. So no moon, good weather, <laughs> and. Mm, it's also important that they need to be close by and possibly observable above our heads so that the atmosphere is thinner, the atmosphere is thinner and signal is a bit better so we can get a bit more. Okay, so you have quite a many like mirrors here, like in many um, optical telescopes you could have monolithic mirrors but in that one um, in, uh, observational facility there, uh, Grantecan, they have many mosaic mirrors and in total they are like over 10 meters in diameter. So how many mirrors are there exactly and uh, why there are small ones and big ones? So we have a diameter globally of 17 meters uh -huh. and to fill it we have 246 mirrors per telescope. Mm -hmm. As you can see in Magic 1, we have different configurations of mirrors. So the big ones, so one panel is one mirror, and smaller ones, one panel is four mirrors. The big ones are one meter per one meter and are of a newer generation, while the smaller ones are 50 centimeters per 50 centimeters and are a bit older. The reason of having different possibilities is that Magic is mm, an experiment, meaning that we can try things and see what works better and at the beginning I think the constraint was more from the industries who were producing them we started with small mirrors okay and then we changed the design and also uh, changed the institution who was taking care so the first ones were um, designed by Max Planck the other ones by Padova in Italy mm -hmm. so I think that they found a way to have panels one meter per one meter of course magic 2 came later so you only have the big panels, the new ones. We didn't install ah. the old ones. And okay. another thing that you cannot notice from here, but maybe we can see from the side, is that uh, Magic One has this, what we call chessboard configuration. So some mirrors are in the rear part, some mirrors are in the front part. Mm -hmm. We had a small engineering issue, meaning that when it was designed, it was not taken into account that our mirrors move. We have the actuators in the back, uh, you can think about it as adaptive optics, but it's not as precise as adaptive optics. Okay. We just want to move them, but they didn't take it into account. So they were touching each other. And then they came out with this nice solution. So we get the same reflectivity and the same precision as if they were all on the same level. All so right. it works fine. <laughs> okay. So, we are now in the, your control room. You have quite a few screens here. Um, can you tell us something about their functionalities or purposes? Yes, first of all, when I first came in here, here I was scared about the amount of screens. Oh. Also because we have a lot of screens and only four keyboards. So, I must admit that at the beginning was a bit confusing. <laughs> but, <laughs> so Cherenkov telescopes are made by three main subsystems. The camera, mm -hmm. the actuators that move the mirrors, and the drive who moves the telescope. For this reason, we have one screen per telescope per subsystem. So, starting from the bottom left, we have a drive of Magic 1, drive of Magic 2. Top part, mirrors of Magic 1, mirrors of Magic 2, where you see the screen open, oh, the window okay. open with the mirror control. The central part is uh, monitoring 
and the central control system. And then on the back we have camera one and camera two. The screens just above are for the schedule of the night and the real-time analysis, so we can see why we are observing if we see something. And then finally on the top, the two solo screens. One is for the weather, because when you observe you are locked inside this room and you have no clue what's going on outside. And the other one is uh, for um, some subsystems like uh, the one we have on the roof, which is called LiDAR, which is just a laser working as a sonar, basically. It shoots a laser to the sky and counts what is coming back and can tell you how many clouds it met. I see, okay. And the white window that you see is connected to the alert system, mostly for GRBs. And if we get a GRB that turns completely red, starts making a weird noise and oh. takes control of the system, and the telescopes start moving by themselves, you get a square in the central control saying, hey guys, don't touch anything. <laughs> Call the people in charge of GRBs and let them tell you what to do. When it happens during the night, you're a bit sleepy. It's <laughs> quite an experience. I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The important thing is that we don't uh, use all the screens during the night. Uh -huh. So mostly we check what's going on from the subsystem screens, but then we work with the central control. Now it's closed because it's, when you close it, it sends data to our data center and does a lot of things. Um, I could open it, but I will not for a simple reason. When you start it, it asks who's working that night. And you get input it just once per night. Oh, okay. And I want to leave it to the guys who are working tonight. Wow. I don't want to put my name there now. By the way, can we look at some data you have gotten? Yes, I don't have fully analyzed data, but I have what we call the real-time analysis. So, what we see during the night. Okay, so you have some color maps here. <laughs> yes, so in our website we have some password protected pages and one of these is the collection of the real-time analysis for each source. Mm -hmm. In this case you are seeing the sky map, so the picture of the region in the sky from where we get signal from the Crab Nebula, which I also mentioned before. It's our calibration source and all the Cherenkov telescopes look at it during the whole year actually to calibrate their performance. So you're probably, when you think about astronomy, you think about the nice, cool pictures, colorful <laughs> pictures of the Crab Nebula. Unfortunately, gamma ray <laughs> pictures are not as nice. And what the map is telling us is just how strong the signal was in that region of the sky. So uh, right ascension and declination. Mm -hmm. And here you can see the excess with respect to the background. So what, what was coming from the source, and um, the purple one is the background. And it does it for different... Um, you, you only have the background or the, or the source and some other quantities that are important for us. And yeah, with the Crab Nebula it's easy because you actually see it. Most of the sources you need so many hours to see something that the real-time analysis is just, is just empty. But then when you stack together the data we actually see something. Thank you for the tour. Well, thanks for visiting us. <laughs> By the way, uh, for the viewers, do you have some uh, like social media or some websites where you can uh, learn more about magic? Uh, yes, actually, we have two websites. One uh, related to the observatory, a Spanish website and the German website, where you can access only some parts with the public information. And then we have the social media. Uh, we have for sure Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Not sure if we have any others, but I think these ones are the, the main, the main ones. And we post usually pictures of what's going on here, what's the life of our observers. So if you want to follow us, all right. So you have also content in English. Right? Yes, yeah. we only have content in English because, of course, our viewers and our magicians come from all Europe. So <laughs> ah, okay, okay. Well, it's good to have a common language and stuff. Well, cool. Yeah, see you around. See you. Okei, näin videon lopussa voitais tuota käydä vielä läpi ää, tiivistelmä siitä, että mitäs me nyt tässä kuulimme. Eli tosiaan näitä kahta Magic Teleskooppia käytetään Cerenkovin säteilyn havaitsemiseen ja 
tällaiset kohteet Serenkovin säteilylle ovat esimerkiksi näitä aktiivisia galaksiytimiä tai kammapurkauksia. Ja he havaitsevat tätä Serenkovin säteilyä, joka siis syntyy ilmakehässä. Ja Magic hän tuota, koostuu siis käsittääkseni 14 maan yhteistyöstä. Ja Suomi on yksi näistä 14 maasta, joka ö, rahoittaa ja tekee tutkimusta tähän liittyen. Jos halutaan tuota, tarkempaa numeroa siitä, kuinka paljon ihmisiä ö, työskentelee tämän tiedon parissa, niin kolme senioritutkijaa sekä sitten kolme väitöskirjatutkijaa tekee Magicin liittyvää tutkimusta. Ja nämä suomalaiset ää, tutkijat ovat siis, tai heidän koti on Turun yliopistossa, Suomen esokeskuksella eli Pinkalla, ää, Metsähovin radioobservatoriolla ja sitten Oulun yliopistolla. Eli tosi monta suomalaista ää, tutkimuslaitosta on mukana myös Magicin toiminnassa. Ja datan tutkimisessa. Ja tämä Suomen osallisuus Magic-teleskoopeissa on siis jatkunut ihan alusta asti, eli vuodesta 2002, jolloin tuota Magic 1 ruvettiin rakentamaan. Tämä toinenhan näistä Magicista ähm, valmistui sitten ähm, muutaman vuoden myöhemmin, olikohan noin 2009. Ja tässä onkin mielenkiintoista erityisesti tälle suomalaisista, että tämä tutkimus, mitä suomalaiset tutkijat on tehneet, niin liittyy siihen, että meillä on tämä Nordic Optical Telescope, joka nyt tällä hetkellä itse asiassa peittyy juuri pilven taakse tonne. Niin he tekevät siis, tai heillä on ohjelmia, joiden ideana on havaita Magicillä sekä sitten tuolla Nordic Optical Teleskoopilla näitä aktiivisia galaksiytimiä samaan aikaan. Ja tästä sitten saadaan tällaista niin kuin kahden eri aallonpituuden aktiviteetin korrelaatiota. Eli kun me käytetään tuota Magicia tuota, tämän kamma-säteilyalueen havaitsemiseen, niin sitten Nordic Optical Telescope äm, hoitaa sitten tuota näkyvän valon aallonpituuden puolta. Ja näiden aktiivisten galaksiytimien sekä vasaarien tutkimuksessa juuri tämmönen äm, monen aallonpituuden äm, tutkiminen samoista kohteista on varsin yleistä, koska sitten me saadaan erilaista tietoa eri aallonpituuksien avulla. Näitä sivustoja, joita Irene suositteli, Mätsikistä liittyvän tiedon hakemiseen, tosiaan sometiliä ja sun muuta, niin kannattaa katsoa noitosta alempaa 